person, each heart, each head bowed, that we would humbly come to this table recognizing and remembering the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us in taking our sin and our punishment that we could come together, we could commune with Him, with God the Father, Pray that you would be with each of us at this time. Use us for your to Jesus Christ and your prayer. You may be seated. see what happens, but then we might be visiting the Blosses again, 
or I could just run off the track. And so I chose running off the track, but there's a lip, and uh, I rolled my ankle on that lip, uh, and I was in quite a bit of excruciating pain. Uh, the next day was Sunday. I did that on Saturday night. The next day was Sunday, and I was supposed to be at camp with the kids all week. <laughs> I thought to myself, this is going to be a miserable week of camp. But I was excited uh, to spend time with the kids, uh, to watch them grow, and so I thought, ah, I'll ice it. And Sunday rolled around, and my ankle was very fat, and I hobbled around, and I was like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And of course, Sunday night, I was sitting at the MPB at uh, camp, and I started to feel a fever coming on. You know, you, if you're like me, you know, even when it's 99 degrees, you know when you're getting a fever. And I thought, are you kidding me? So we went home early, Alicia and I did. I went to the doctor the next day. I got some antibiotics and I kind of uh, took those and I pretty much just slept all day Monday. And I felt bad because then Gavin was there alone working two jobs trying to do maintenance for the camp and trying to be with the kids. I felt really bad and I took my antibiotics, Tuesday rolled around uh, and I started to feel a little better. I talked with Gavin because everybody's kind of in corona panic and I was like, well, the doctor said that it was bacterial, can I come back? And Gavin got back with me and he said, yeah, you can come back. Uh, we don't think you have the corona. <sighs> so it was an interesting week. And I do believe that maybe Satan was at work in some ways there trying to keep me away from the camp. Not that it's about me, but it certainly was good for me. It certainly was a good week of camp for the kids. Church camp, in my opinion, is so great. And I was thinking about why is it so great? Obviously it's fun. Obviously we want kids to have fun, right? But if it's just fun, we can send them to a thousand other things, and they'll have fun there too. So I, I came up with a list of three. One was, it's a yearly reminder of essential truths and worship. Uh, I think it's good that young people have a yearly time where they come back to the essential truths they know, and they worship in a community, in a body of young people. I think that's good. I think that's unique to church camp. Number two was, it's a community for accountability of promises made to God. Uh, so I think we've all, if we've been to camp, we all know that maybe we leave camp and we say, these are some things we're going to do different in our life. And when the next year rolls around, there's always time to reflect and see whether or not we made progress in those promises. I think that's good for young people. And number three, it's encouragement and strengthening of faith. And again, a yearly designated place for young people to be encouraged and strengthened in their faith, I think that is excellent. I think all of these properties come together at church camp to keep people, young people, from stagnating in their faith, from calcifying the old one. And I was thinking about communion devotion today, and I thought, you know what? There's a weekly opportunity for this. Maybe not the same way. Maybe not with all the lights and the band, but there's a weekly opportunity for all of these things. It's found at the communion table. I think a lot of times we kind of, or at least in my own experience, I kind of wander through my week, and somehow through a, a few, I find my way back to church on Sunday, and I was like, it was just Sunday a day ago. And then at communion time, there's time for me to reflect on that week. To think about the things that I heard in the sermon last week, things that I said perhaps I should be different with. It's community oriented. We partake of communion as a body, not alone. And it's an opportunity and a time to be encouraged and strengthened in our faith. Uh, one of the nights at camp, I heard a verse read, it was a large section of verses uh, from Psalms, and I heard a portion of it, but I don't think I ever heard the, read, the whole thing read out loud. Uh, and I think perhaps there's no better verse for communion time than this. This is in Psalms. It's Psalms 51, 1-17. Some of you I'm sure are really familiar with the Psalms. 
This is a psalm that David wrote right after he committed his sin with Bathsheba and murdered Uriah. I think it's easy for us to say, yes, David sinned with Bathsheba. But this was the darkest moment in David's life. This was not one sin, but many sins. And not light sins that we like to paint over and say, oh, it's just a small lie, or, or oh, I didn't do that well. David, perhaps, he had, he, had an, he had an affair with a married woman, and he had her husband murder. And this is what he wrote when Nathan the prophet confronts him. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide, hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore in, restore in me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God. You who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Do not, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God. You will not despise. I think if there was a prayer we could pray today during communion, that each of you that one.
you wouldn't believe how hard it is to preach a timely sermon. What I mean by that, something happens in the, in the nation, and, and I'm, well, I wish I'd preached about that before it happened, but uh, kind of interesting, with what's been going on in our country, I've had plenty of time to plan this sermon. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and then when I get in there this morning, <clears throat> and I know I'm going to present this sermon, I hear that there was uh, riots in Portland uh, last night, Seattle, Washington last night, Austin, Texas last night, Aurora, Colorado last night, Oakland, California last night, Omaha, Nebraska last night, Los Angeles last night. Those were all the headlines this morning. So what I'm trying to tell you is this is pretty timely. You know, it's one of those things where I took uh, plenty of time to work on this sermon. I've been talking about this for several weeks, but this has kind of been plenty of time for me to, to really get this to where we understand what's going on. Someone told me that Facebook is really lit up about this, what's going on around here. I don't do Facebook, but I can imagine that people lit, lit this up and, and talk plenty about it. And I'll just tell you, you can have your opinion. You can have your opinion. Uh, you can have your, your theories about the bottom line causing this. And I know there's a lot of them out there. All right? What I want to do and what my job is as your pastor is to give you what the Bible says about these things. Okay? Then I'm going to try not to give you my opinions, which is really hard because, you know, I, I have opinions as well as you do. But I want to show you what the Bible has to say about these things. I want to show you today about how we relate to our government. What the government exists for. We're going to talk about all these things. And, and maybe uh, you never thought about this, but the Bible speaks a lot about the government and us. Okay? In fact, one of the classic passages of Scripture is in Romans chapter 13. I'd like for you to turn there. If you have if you your Bibles, you want to look at that. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read for you beginning in verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. Now, this is important. The authority that exists have been established by God. All right? Get that start. Consequently, he rebels against authority, meaning the government authority, is rebelling against what God has instituted. Those who do so will bring judgment and condemnation on themselves, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. If you want to be free from the fear of uh, the one in authority, then do what is right, and he will commend you. Very important. Four, he, the government, is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for it is not the bearer's sword for nothing. He, the government, is God's servant and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Now, some of you are going to be a little shook up by this sermon today because maybe you already have an opinion about this. But I want to show you what God has to say about this. All right? First thing I want to talk about is God's precept. He says to us several times in that passage, by the way, three times, submit to the government. Submit to the government. Submit, submit. Our job, our relationship with the government is that we are to submit. Okay? Now, this is an overreaching precept God has all the time. There's always humility. There's always submitting in, in, God's, in, in God's rule in that sense. But God's word, world says, word says this. If you claim to be a Christian... You're going to have to be a good citizen. Okay? Now, I'll just tell you, I know there's a lot of good citizens in Lawrence County and Christian County and Perry County. I know there's a lot of good Christian people that aren't Christians. I mean, good citizens that aren't Christians. But I can tell you this. If you're a Christian, then you need to be a good citizen. Okay? If you are going to name the name of Jesus Christ and you're going to claim to be a Christian, then the Bible says you're going to submit to your government and you ought to be a good citizen. And the, and the question is, then, why? Why Why do I have to be a good citizen? Well, this passage gives us three reasons why we should be. All right, number one, if there's a spiritual reason for us to be good citizens. Why? God instituted law and order. God instituted law and order. See, it's, it's, it's God who set up the government. Okay? He institutes law and order. That's why God gives us the book. That's the law. There's a moral law in the Old Testament, by the way, that hasn't changed. 
Okay, we, we say, well, I don't go by the law of the Old Testament. That's right. You don't have the ceremonial law. There is a moral law that has to change. All right? And then we also, God is a God of order. Look at out into the universe. You'll see that God is a God of order. But in this case, he wants order, not chaos. God wants order, not chaos. And you can write this verse down. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not a God of confusion, but a God of order. He likes everything in order, you see. Now, notice the word instituted here in, in verse 2. In our world, God has set up several important institutions. All right? For instance, he set up the institution of the family. And the family has established some lines of authority. Okay? We have the head, the husband is the head of the family. The parents have authority over the children. Okay? And, and when those lines of authority are broken down, then chaos and dysfunction happens in our families. Okay? We see that a lot in our country today, don't we? Where there's, a, there's chaos. They're because we have a dysfunction family, dysfunctional families. Families are falling apart because God's line of authority is not being observed even. Okay? But God also established the institution of the church. And the church, according to the New Testament, he's given us as spiritual leaders to lead by serving. We're to be leaders to show people and to be a part where we, we teach about what God wants us to do. But also God instituted human government. All right, think about this. If we don't obey the lines of authority that God has established, then chaos results in our society as we see today. God wants our society to have peace and order. That's why he established governments. You know why he wants peace and order by that? Because he wants the gospel to get out. The gospel gets out a lot easier when it's a lot peaceful in it. Isn't that right? It seems like to me that a lot more things get done when we're not trying to, to keep uh, trying to fix all the problems going around us in that way. But you see, God wants our society to have peace and order, and so he established governments. Now, you may find it hard to believe, but the Bible says that God is one who puts people in the roles of leadership and governments. Okay? Daniel chapter 2, verse 2 says, God sets up kings and he removes kings. Okay? Now, uh, those of you like me who love history uh, may find it hard to believe that throughout history, God has been behind the scenes just orchestrating events so everything will happen the way God wants it to happen. Now, let me give you an example about that. Why do you think Caesar Augustus declared a census to be taken by everyone and want them to be taxed? Why do you think he did that? Well, I'll tell you why he did it. God needed a way to get Joseph and Mary out of Nazareth to Bethlehem, the home of their ancestors, so that because the, the Bible predicted the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so God gave Caesar Augustus an idea. I need to get these people back to their hometowns to be taxed. Caesar thought it was his idea. God gave him that idea, didn't he? How about, uh, uh, you know, when you start putting all those things together <clears throat> um, and you start thinking, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, well, what about, uh, what about Hitler? I mean, if we're going to get out and talk about leaders, let's talk about Hitler. Let's talk about Hitler. Unfortunately, yeah. Well, what about Vladimir uh, uh, Putin? Uh, yeah. That's right. There's some bad leaders out there. But I'll tell you, God has also put good leaders where they have been good throughout the years. Our country is an example of that. There's a lot of been a lot of great leaders in our country who have led this country to do what God wants us to do even at times. I hope you're, some of you are thinking ahead of me though and, and, you're, and you're thinking, hmm, uh, did God put our leaders in place in some of these places where things were falling apart? Um, I thought that people went to polls and they voted them in there. What's the deal? How'd that work? Well, <clears throat> Let me listen. I want you to listen to this. Godless leaders are God's reward for immoral and godless culture. Do you understand that? In other words, wicked leaders are simply God's reward for a wicked culture. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but I'll just tell you, the last 30 years in America, we have, we have departed from God's instituted moral standards that have made us great. And because of that, we've been going down and down and down. So you shouldn't be surprised when you're living in a, in a world where government reflects the lives of the culture around it. You understand that? That's why it's so important that you vote. And you vote what God wants you to vote. 
But God is the one who sets up those governments. He institutes governments as leaders. He says that because, uh, and because he does that, I just submit. And you say, well, hmm, even leaders aren't the greatest? You know what? Paul wrote this when they had a leader named Nero. Nero was a terrible guy. I mean, he was, uh, let me tell you uh, the best description of him. He was sadistic, he was cruel, and he was a wicked man. Okay? That's who he was talking about. When Paul right, wrote that, he was the leader, and he said, you know what? You need to submit to your government authorities. Well, what if the government tells us to do something that's forbidden by the word of God? Or what if the government tells us we can't do something God tells us to do? All right? Those are questions. Good questions. Who are we to obey? Are you ready for this? You are to obey God rather than man. On the rare occasion that happens. You know what I mean? Civil disobedience is right when there's a clear conflict between man's laws and God's laws. Sometimes Christians must commit civil disobedience and be willing to face the consequence of civil disobedience. Let me give you a couple of illustrations from history. One is this. You remember a guy named Pharaoh? Pharaoh said, let's kill all the Jewish boys. Remember that? There were some really brave midwives that said, no, we're not going to kill them. We're going to disobey that law. And because they disobeyed that law, we got Moses. Remember that? Okay. How about uh, Daniel? He went to Babylon. He was the prime minister, second guy in charge. And they made a law said, you know, for the last, next 30 days, you can only pray to Darius. And Daniel said, I'm not going to do that. He prayed like usual every day. Opened the window, looked at Jerusalem, prayed to God. Guess what? They threw him in the lion's den. You saw what God did to help him out. Tad about Meshach and Abednego. When the song is playing, you are to fall down and worship the statue. And they said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't care if it is the law. If they're in the fiery furnace, and they were the only ones that didn't get burnt. See, sometimes we're called to obey God rather than men. And when we do, we may face alliance against. We may face fiery furnaces, okay? But I assure you, God will be with you if you're true to him and honor him. See, what's right? Though in America, when the government says you cannot pray in public, I'm going to pray in public. I'm going to do that. They say I can't speak the word in public. I'm going to preach the word in public. They tell me there's certain topics I can't talk about. I want to talk about what the Bible says. Right? You understand that? Now I'll do that humbly, and I'll do it sincerely, realizing that I might have to face the consequences, but I'll do it. And I, you should too. Okay? At some point, you know, I think about this. I think about the poor church in California. You know? Um, still closed up through this, but yet they opened the bars. Somewhere along the line, I'm thinking, hmm, they're opening up the bars, but they're not opening the churches. Um, there's a difference there, isn't there? Uh, maybe there's a conflict. Um, I'm thinking we'd probably be going to church in that case. You know what I mean? Uh, there's just some of those things that you got to think about really call it carefully. <coughs> How about. Um, this passage we read earlier, remember that? Peter and John, they were preaching the word of God. They said, you can't, you got to stop preaching about Jesus. What did they say? We don't care. We're gonna, we got to obey God rather than men. What happened to them? They got flogged. What happened when they left after they got flogged? It says that they went away rejoicing because they had the privilege to suffer for Jesus' name's sake. So there's that point. Charles Ryrie, uh, I want to read what he said about this. When civil law and God's law are in opposition, the Bible obligates Christians to protest and don't disobey. But when a Christian feels he should be disobeyed his government, he must be sure that it is not that the government has denied him his personal rights, but because he has denied him his God's rights. The power of every government authority comes from God. See what I'm saying? It's not my rights, but it's God's rights. What God wants me to do. Okay. Do you remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate? Pilate asked him a whole bunch of questions he should never answer. And then Pilate said, out of frustration, he said, don't you know that I can have you killed? And what did Jesus say to him? He said, no. He said, you don't have any power except power that was given from above. Remember that? Boy, I bet that just stopped Pilate in his, in his tracks. That's pretty profound. See, that's where government gets its power. It's power from God. There's a spiritual reason why we ought to obey the government. It's because God instituted it, okay? But there's another reason we ought to obey and submit to our government. That is an external reason. It's because God entrusted punishment to the state. Okay? The state or the government. God said, God, oh, this could be a way I'm going to get revenge. He said, I'm going to use uh, the government, the authority that I put up there, 
uh, to execute judgment. It means you don't break the laws of America because you know that when you break the laws of America, you're going to get punished. I'm going to quote that. Because we don't see that so much, do we? You're going to get punished. If you rip off somebody's house and you get caught, you're going to go to jail. Okay? You do something wrong, you're going to get, get, get punished. And that's what it says. God has the authority to punish. And government, God has given government that authority. I, that's why I firmly believe with all my heart that our law enforcement should never be called pigs. Never. You should never do that. You should respect them. They are God's servant to execute law enforcement. You should support them. You should be happy for them. But you should do what I see in our world today. That's why I believe our judges are not selfish people doing things out of their own motives, but they are placed there by God. And as it says, God's servants, what? To make sure punishment is given out when crimes committed. That's what they're there for. I don't know about you, but every time I see <laughs> um, somebody parking in a handicapped parking lot, don't have a sticker or a license plate that has handicap, and they, they jump out of their car and run in because you know they want to be first. They had to get close. But there was empty space. Even though it was handicap, and they run in, they run right back out. You know, it's no big deal. Just one time. Does that bother you? Like it bothers me. Apparently, uh, it does. I'll shake your head. Um, I hate that when that happens. I even I had a handicap sticker when I had my knee surgery, and I still didn't park in there because I thought someone else did worse than I did. <laughs> um, that's terrible, but it's easy for me to talk about that because it's something I don't ever do. What about driving on the speed limit? Hmm? Are y'all there? Okay. Some of you are saying, boy, he's meddling now. He's preaching a minute ago, now he's meddling. <laughs> um, let me, let me tell you, uh, I'm convinced that the last part of my body that's going to be saved is my right foot. Just saying. <laughs> um, God and Sheriff are working on my conviction on that. You know, I, uh, I, it's conviction I've got. You know, I, 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 I literally have slowed down after a couple of tickets back when I was younger, you know, and uh, uh, I learned to slow down. But I'll just tell you, uh, it's under conviction. And also, uh, the, the bottom line is, is that I'm not as good as driver's face would be. It's hard, it's hard to admit that, but that's the way it is. So I'm slowing down. Um, you know, it's kind of a spiritual matter. I, I'll just ask you, what do you do when you're going to a speed limit and uh, you see one of those uh, Dodge uh, cars that have high patrol signs on the side? What do you do? Slam on your brakes? You do. I know you do because I've been behind you when you've done that. You know? Uh, so and here, here's the question. Why do you do that? Because you don't want to take it. Right? You don't want to get a fine. You don't want anything on your insurance to go up. Right? All right? That's what I'm talking about. There's an extra reason why you should obey the laws to avoid punishment. Period. Obey the laws to avoid punishment. Okay? Don't rob a bank. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? You, uh, you don't take anyone's life. You don't have to worry about the government taking your life. That's just the way it is. Okay? And the point is basically is this, is that, the, you know, we look at what's going on in this country, and it just blows your mind. You don't want to get in trouble. Don't do, you know, don't want to do the time. Don't do the crime. And now it goes. Verse 4 again says this. If you do wrong, be afraid. For the government does not bear the what? Huh? The 357 Magnum. I'm just putting it into our vernacular. Okay? Most cops don't carry swords anymore. You know what I mean? They don't carry them for any reason. The reason they carry it is to make sure that they take care of you. Take care of you. You know? It didn't say that it's going to whip your last year and give you a jail sentence. It said there's a sword. It means there's deadly force can be used for this. The government is God's servant, it says. An agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Boy, look what's happening in America today, and I wonder where did that go? You don't know what policemen are for. There's a great book by Dr. Gordon Talbot, and it's 
not a new book. He points out that right now in America, a felony is committed every 20 seconds. Every 20 seconds, a felony committed. Can you imagine that? I'm sure that's more than that now. And over the last 30 years, church attendance in America has increased 3%, while the rate of illegitimate births have increased 300%. Sometimes, you know, we think, why are we spending all this money for the Lord's work in all the churches and that kind of thing? He points out in his book that for every dollar spent in America on, on or by churches, $12,000 spent on crime. One to 12000 I don't mind telling you that I believe the Bible is very clear about punishment. You know, we think a lot about Chuck Swindoll, don't we? I mean, you know, you, you kind of think of him as a, um, the, uh, uh, the idea of being a great pastor. You know, we, we think about him a lot. But let me, let me read what he says. He says, I believe if crime is going to reach the media and television, social capital punishment. And he says, I, I do not say this out of sadism. If a criminal is going to come out on top and we witness his work, we should witness the end result of his death. If the dead lie in the street and pull of blood, the television camera scan for all the world to see, in my opinion, I'm of the opinion that the walls of the penitentiary should be open uh, to the television camera. And on the day the criminal is put to death, it should be televised as well. I know it's a severe position, but the Bible says government does not bear the sword for nothing. I watched True Grit last night because uh, I couldn't sleep. Uh, so I watched True Grit. Probably the 50th time I've watched it this year. It's on about every two or three days, it seems like. <clears throat> you know how that movie starts? That public hanging. You know why they did that? You know why they did public hanging? Did anyone know? It was a deterrent. It was a deterrent. They didn't do bad things because they knew it could happen. Well, there's a third reason. What about the Smith government? What is the spiritual reason? God set them up. External reason as well. Don't do it. Don't do the time. And don't do the crime. Can't do the time, right? And then there's an internal reason. Keep a clear conscience. Verse 5. Two reasons why it says in that verse to obey the government. One of them is possible punishment. And we already talked about that. But the other one is because of conscience. Hear that? So the best reason to obey the government is not because um, if you don't, you're going to be punished. But the best reason, a higher motive, is to do it because it's the right thing to do. Okay? You know what your conscience does? Your conscience says, do what's right. Isn't that right? That's what we're supposed to do. God has given every one of us a conscience. Your conscience is a part of you when you think about doing something wrong or you're doing done something wrong. Your conscience screams out, don't do that or you shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? That's what your conscience does. Now, question, can you let your conscience be your guide? No, you really can't because really the Bible also says that some people have become so hard-hearted that their conscience has been seared like a hot iron. And there's no feeling there anymore. They become desynthesized and evil in their lives, okay? So they can't do that. We see people doing terrible things. Their contents are seared, folks, okay? And, you know, bottom line, you can't let your conscience be your guide, but you let the Holy Spirit be your guide. You surrender your conscience to Jesus is what you do. 1 Timothy 1 5 says, The goal of this commandment is love, which comes from a pure heart. And a good conscience and a sincere faith. Let's drive down the road again. Um, you're going to speed limit. You see a cop. What do you do? Another uh, thing. Does it feel better? Yeah. You don't have that sudden anxiety. Why? Because you did the right thing. There's a lot of things like that as we do. When it comes to the rentals, you pay your taxes. The so verse goes down and talks about paying your taxes. And what just give unto God and God and receive what Caesar's do. Pay your taxes. You know, um, when that's when you get that letter from the IRS and you pay your taxes, you feel better. But if you've done something wrong, you get that letter from the 
I'll, I'll just tell you, let it matter, it's going to scare you no matter what. But uh, bottom line, uh, you, you just know that you haven't done anything wrong, right? And that's the point. I'll tell you, let me tell you a true story of a pastor who was uh, in Alabama, and he was driving to a meeting to another county. And he was late, and he was supposed to uh, head up the meeting, so he was flying 20 miles over the speed limit. Then he remembered all of a sudden that he had a Christian bumper sticker on his car. And suddenly, conscience started to give him a little fit. He was saying to himself, what do these people think about you when you uh, drive in 20 miles over the speed limit, and uh, they pull you over, and you're, you're doing that, and then they see that such sticker on the back, and he had a real dilemma. So what do you do? Well, they pull over, ran around the back, ripped that bumper sticker off, and took off again. See that? That's what one way to handle it. But at least his conscience was bothering him a little bit. Okay? You feel guilty about breaking the law of man and being a Christian? Not because you're going to be punished. But you're doing the right thing. The Bible says, listen to your conscience if your conscience is strength to God. Folks, we need to support our law enforcement. We don't need to defund them. We need to support them. They are God's servants. They're out there. And we're called to be good citizens in a country that's full of people right now that are destroying this country. So we do have a real tough time in that situation. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all you do. And I praise you for the fact that you have given in our society Thanks and peace. And I pray, Father, you just continue to help us to understand uh, and be those who speak out in, in our country today. We give you praise in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's all be standing as we Volunteers, so if you're junior high on up, we could use your help. Uh, come and 
come and find me or Aaron or just show up and we can put you to work uh, August 3rd through the 7th. And uh, um, speaking of which, if we could get, you say, six guys? Um, I think these six guys to help me out. How many guys I can get? Yeah. I've got some things downstairs that need to be brought up here. So okay. we're going to bring them up and stack them against the wall here. Yeah. Uh, so if you uh, want to take long enough, mm -hmm. get enough guys. That's right after the service. Yeah. Uh, that this week was the last week of camp at Maranatha. Like Ryan was saying, it was a great summer, and I'm really glad I got to see so many of you there. But uh, I'm looking forward to next year, and was thankful for all the spirit was doing there. It's a, it was a powerful, powerful summer. Very good. Yeah. Uh, fall kickoff is right around the corner. I know. I mean, it's hot for us, and I got it, but we're we're about there. Fall's about here, so fall kickoff's coming up. Um, our theme, which has lost me. Better is one day. Better is one day. Yeah. That's our theme for this year. Uh, we'll be having a meeting on uh, August 9th. Uh, so if you get any ideas, stuff that you we've done in the past you want to see us do again, stuff in the past you don't want us to do again, whatever, come to that meeting, help us plan it. Um, then we are also having the Back to School Bash on the 15th from 10 to noon. Uh, we are needing donations for supplies for the kids to back to school, and we always run out of pencils and markers. So. Expo markers. Yeah, the Expo dry erase markers. So we need to focus on pencils and markers. That's what we always run out of. So, uh, and then also today is Benevolent Sunday. The extra basket is here in the back. Okay. Anything else? Softball game eight thirty tomorrow. Okay. All right. Hope it rains. Hope it gets rained out. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, we're praying for rain. Well, God bless you for being here today. It was great to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Always is. So I'll be standing. I'm going to ask Gavin to go close the prayer. Dear Father, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for all the opportunities you give us in, in this great country. I pray that we don't squander them and, and really lift up your name and glorify it uh, as much as we can. And pray that we do honor our authorities in our walk and in the way we talk and in, in the way we vote. I hope we honor you and, and throughout this week and this coming fall, I, I pray that we can um, stay unified and in your son's name I pray, amen.